Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 767. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's October 21st, 2022. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. Yep, 767. When will we stop? I don't know. I, we should, probably should have stopped at like episode 17, but we're going to go on because this is where Kevin and George sit down and talk about news that's interesting to us. We uh, turn our webcams on, we press record, and we talk about religion, news, politics, weather, and other things. And I'm going to start with weather this week because I have just arrived back at home base here in Webster, Florida, and it's 70. There's a light breeze coming out of the north, and I think the weather is wonderful. I said, George, aren't we having wonderful weather this morning? And you responded, <laughs> oh, oh! It's it. I had to break out the the heavy woolen coats, uh, the quilts on the bed. It's uh, it's seventy, Kevin. It's uh, freezing. Uh, you have a different perspective. You were in Florida all summer long. You survived the seventies, nineties, thousand degree uh, temperatures. Hurricane Ian uh, was here as well. Whereas I kind of traveled in that seventy degree uh, weather spans uh, through the uh, Midwest and East. Uh, coast of America this year and was it was very comfortable so yeah I'm not staying through those 90s 95s no way in fact our hottest day on our whole trip was like 91 degrees one day when we we're up in Pennsylvania just for perspective George let's move on to the news last week we reported on Incarnation Anglican Church uh, from the Diocese of Western Anglicans had departed the ACNA in the diocese and left for another diocese uh, that was outside the ACNA. And there were several reports coming out at the time and we're reading some things. And Bishop Keith Andrews wanted to provide some clarification on our reporting last week. And he sent me a document that I'd like to read here um, because we had reported that uh, uh, Father Joshua Lichter was under discipline uh, from uh, Bishop Keith Andrews at the time of his departure. And well, that lets people go, well, why was that? So he has clarified that. He says, the reasons for discipline did not include moral failure. Incarnation Anglican Church followed the canons for local church departure from the ACNA and voted unanimously as a congregation to leave. Preparations were made by the local church and its leaders to depart in advance of the onset of disciplinary action, and the departure did not result from the discipline or take place in response to the discipline. And I think that, you know, that provides clarity because uh, a lot of people, and this has kind of been a recent history uh, within the Episcopal Church and uh, a couple of uh, Anglicans, uh, whoop, I'm, I'm going somewhere else, George. And you find out, well, maybe in other cases there has been moral failure. That's why they went somewhere mm -hmm. else. Here, we are assured by uh, Bishop uh, Keith that there was that was not what happened here. Um, I've not had time to investigate where he's going, but somebody told me it's a diocese here in Florida. The uh, well, the the presiding bishop uh, lives in Florida. It's a okay. national diocese. Uh, I believe there are eight congregations and about 300 parishioners in this uh, uh, Diocese of the Emmaus Way, I believe it's called. Okay, cool. All right. The biggest news of the week is the GAFCON Primates uh, Council met together and they provided a communique, which is quite thorough. And I thought we could talk about that because it talks about Sergeant Schultz. I'm talks about Justin Welby, talks about some of the recent news we reported on last week where the new dean to Canterbury Cathedral is living in a same-sex uh, marriage partnership. So, George, let's talk a little bit about the communique. Communique, uh, this was a scheduled meeting of the primates, and in attendance were Kenya, uh, Rwanda, the ACNA, Nigeria, the Indian Ocean, and Uganda. And uh, ben Kwashi, the General Secretary of GAFCON, could not attend because he's undergoing chemotherapy 
here in the United States for liver cancer. That was mentioned in the communique, that he is mm -hmm. unwell and to pray for him. So they had a full meeting and they talked about the Lambeth Conference. They talked about l local problems within their di provinces. Uh, Ebola is becoming a problem along with famine in the Uganda, things like that, that uh, uh, are good to know and good to raise up. The most verbiage was around this David Monteith and Justin Welby business. They started off by saying, Justin Welby oversaw the appointment of a partnered gay man, Stephen Knott, to be head of the Archbishop's Appointment Committee. And this is the fruit of that appointment. The Dean of Canterbury Cathedral is a partnered gay man. The old, uh, that old boy network is running on full speed. And Justin Welby, through Anthony Pogo, the General Secretary of the ACC, sent a WhatsApp message. The primates have a WhatsApp group and documents are exchanged that way. They've moved from email, they moved from snail mail. In my lifetime, they've moved from snail mail to email, uh, snail mail to faxes to email. Yeah. They're now on a WhatsApp group. That's pretty progressive for this group. Yeah, and the WhatsApp group letter had a letter from Justin Welby where he announced David Monteith's appointment, mentioned that he was a partnered gay man, but then said, I had nothing to do with this because this was done by the, by the Crown Nominations Commission. The primates at GAFCON were unimpressed, and they said just, and in their communique, they said Justin Welby was not being entirely straightforward, because after all, he was on the committee that appointed the Dean of Canterbury. And if, and if Justin did not want a gay man to be head of the Canterbury Cathedral, a partnered gay man living outside the standards of Christian morality, then he could have done something, but he didn't. So in, they, in fact, I can't think of any bishop in history who did not have some influence or say over the Dean of their cathedral. Why, why all of a sudden now? Well, it, the answer is that Justin is being disingenuous. That's the word uh, from Gafcon. That he, the man can't be trusted because he will talk out of both sides of his mouth. Um, that he can't do anything about this appointment, but the fellows are, you know, he can write in the public announcement how wonderful David Monteith is and how happy he is. And then he can tell the primates, well, I had nothing to do with this, and there is nothing I can do. So, you know, there was different audiences get different responses. And the world is, is such a small place now with uh, communications that you can't fob off on the Africans this nonsense of, well, I had nothing to do with this. I can't control it. There's a bureaucratic machine that just, you know, out, this is what popped out. They're not buying it. And no, the, the the Global South, in their response to the uh, David Monteith appointment, said that uh, the Canterbury era of Anglicanism is done. Um, as an aside, if you look at what the hallmarks of Anglicanism are, the reformers, what they came up with, Cramner and all these people, the Archbishop of Canterbury plays little if no part of Anglican identity. It's only a post-World War II creation that giving him this sort of authority and the uh, in, and the, what the so-called instruments of unity, which came out of a conference at Virginia Theological Seminary. And these and they basically said the instruments community are the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Anglican Consultative Council, the Primates Meeting and the Lambeth Conference. These are all signs of our visible unity. Well, that idea came up in 1997. The Anglicanism, so for the prior 400 years, there was nothing like that. And now the primates are saying, and beside the fact that this was voted down at Lambeth and has never been formally recognized, they're saying that the Archbishop of Canterbury really does need to... Uh, the, the, the position of first among equals should no longer by default go to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And though there have been statements from Lambeth conferences over the years talking about the importance of it, 
Justin Welby has been both ele simultaneously elevating the appointment of the Archbishop of Canterbury's position so that he can, without consultation, appoint a bishop to the bishops. He can appoint his former chaplain and schoolmate, uh, Joe Bailey Wells. They were at Durham University together for three years. He can appoint her to be bishop to the bishops without any, they didn't advertise the job. They didn't have any sort of, uh, you know, it was just, you know, jobs for the boys. It so on one hand, it didn't, it didn't go through the call. Crown Nomination Committee. It just, no. hey, I had a job here. Oh, no, I don't have a job here. Let me, you got nothing to do in the next couple of years. Let me create a post for you. Yeah. So on one hand, Welby is becoming a, a pope. And then on the other hand, he's making these statements, I can't discipline, I can't do anything. Yeah. And the Global South first and now Gaff kind of said, eh, we're done. We've had it. Um, well, I, Justin Welby's biggest failure is he wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to be able to, to offer unity when he is the king of disunity. Uh, the church is based on foundational documents, doctrines, creeds, and beliefs. And when you step outside those, you're providing chaos. So you wake up every morning and you find the Anglican Communion, especially the Church of England, is in chaos and is being investigated and is in the papers all day long for bad news. It's because you guys have lost focus on the creeds, the doctrines, and the need for the church to provide a gospel to a broken world. Yeah. We're entering a new phase in the Anglican Wars, in my opinion. Uh, the past phase was a rebellion or rejection of the Archbishop of Canterbury and his authority. I think we're moving now quite clearly into a phase of ignoring the Archbishop of Canterbury in that the GAFCON and Global South primates essentially are not giving Justin Welby the authority that he claims to have. They're ignoring him. They're saying that, you know, what you say doesn't matter and we're just going to do what we're going to do. You have no, you have no canonical, you have no moral, you know, have no spiritual oversight. You just are a relic of history. And we honor that history, but that's not going to drive uh, the work of the church, which is to bring souls to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. So this started with Nigeria under Rowan Williams, of essentially saying, we're not going to be at war with you, we just don't care what you have to say. And it, that circle's expanding. And here's the part part for Justin Welby, it's expanding within the Church of England. The liberals are going their own way, the conservatives are going their own way. And it's really only the House of Bishops, which over the past generation has been changed into a uh, yes-man club for the Archbishop of Canterbury, who back him. So part, I, I think I'm beginning to understand why the great deal of anger from people like uh, J Josiah Wadawa Ferron and Justin Welby towards Gafcon primates, towards you and me, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's not I that we're well irritating, out. it's not that we're irritating, which is we are, it's just that we're pointing out that the emperor has no clothes and no cl and that is starting to get a wider and wider wider uh appreciation well i think he also has no appreciation or understanding for failure mm. the last two lambus were failures uh mm -hmm. inside outside financially uh, they didn't bring unity at all to the communion. They caused more chaos, uh, especially the last one. And now I see that uh, Bishop for Episcopal Ministry appointed to build on the success successful Lambeth Conference. Which successful Lambeth Conference is she going to build upon? Uh, the Right Reverend Dr. Joy, Joe jo Bailey Webb, well. currently Bishop of Dorking, is now going to be Bishop for building on the success of the Lambeth Conference. There was no success. Every Orthodox Bishop and Archbishop that went, that I spoke to uh, in private, so I'm not gonna release anything, said they're not gonna go back to another Lambeth. That this this was their last Lambeth. I said, wow, okay, that doesn't sound successful. You know, I don't understand this, George. The, uh, 
the game of kicking the can down the road, I think the road has come to an end. Uh, the uh, There's no more space ahead. There will be attempts uh, to find space here and there, but uh, we really are turning into an Anglican Federation, not an Anglican Communion. Yeah, I mean, we're going to, we're, we're going to wind up closer to the Lutheran model, the Lutheran World Federation, where you can have the Church of Sweden, which is as far out as you can be, and the Ethiopian Lutheran Church, which is conservative as you can be. And they're all happy in one body because what the Swedes do makes no difference to the Ethiopians. We're we're there now, I think, in many aspects. I think we are because as far as the uh, population and populace of the Orthodox Anglican Communion, uh, all 80 million of us, we have large provinces like Nigeria, Uganda, and African provinces. We have smaller provinces here in the Church of England and uh, Canada and the Episcopal Church. And in as such, they don't agree on very much. They're kind of ecumenical partners at best. They're certainly not communion partners. You know, well, it, well, that's how you describe the Episcopal Church. We have interfaith relationships with other dioceses. Central Florida doesn't have an ecumenical relationship with uh, New Hampshire. It has an interfaith. Uh, they're a different faith than we are. Um, but, that's how we, but, but we're held together by the pension fund and by a common prayer book and thank goodness the pension fund is governed by the state laws of new york uh otherwise uh who knows what the crazies would be up to there well now that we're seeing a bigger divide within the anglican communion it's going to be interesting to see how much influence trinity wall street's money will have in african countries uh you know because this divide has to come where we say no to money we say no to that power. We say no to that influence. We have our own now. We're going to go straight with the Orthodox understanding of Christianity, and we're going to have to rebuild and restart this communion uh, with GAFCON and the Global South. Uh, how much influence can uh, the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, and uh, forces like Trinity Wall Street still have? Well, money, will always, money will always buy attention, and money will always buy a loyalty. Um, what the problem Trinity Wall Street faces is, is that they're not getting value for the money they're giving out. Uh, they're giving out money to Tanzanian dioceses left and right. And the Tanzanian diocese will say the right thing and do the right thing in the face of uh, uh, the people from New York, but then they go and vote uh, their conscience or their interests, mm -hmm. which are not aligned with the United States. Oh. All right, let's move on to some more news. Uh, one of my favorite bishops, Bishop Fitz Allison, has joined the ACNA. Uh, he sent a letter or called, I guess he sent a letter to presiding Bishop Michael Curry saying, I'm out of here. Now, he has been a critic of the church for the longest time, uh, back to the point where he, uh, he was a bishop of South Carolina. This is amazing, George. Uh, I'm glad to see it. Uh, what do you make of it? You're still in the Episcopal Church. Yes, uh, I I have a relationship that goes back over 30, 35 years with Fitzsimmons Allison. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when I was going through the ordination process, uh, I sat down with him. He was visiting my parish. Uh, and he uh, said to me, George, would you be willing to die for Jesus Christ? And I said, yes, of course. He said, would you be willing for your children? Because at that point I had infant sure. children. Would you be willing sure. for your children to be tacky for Jesus Christ? And I said, I don't know what you mean. He said, well, you know, um, you've, you've grown up accustomed to a certain lifestyle and background. And as a priest, you're not going to be able to provide that. And you're going to be with people of all backgrounds, all creed, all classes. And are you willing to throw yourself so completely into the life of the people you're serving that you're willing to sacrifice the social standing of your children? That was a profound thing to ask because, you know, it's easy for one to sacrifice oneself, but are you sacrificing your family? Well, we made that decision. Yes, God is in charge. And, you know, we've, I've almost always served in poor or working class or lower class 
uh, congregations. Um, this is, if you will, the most socially uh, prominent one. And we are in Hooterville, Florida. And uh, we have good old boys and we have a few wealthy people. But it's I've never served in suburbia, if you will. Well, I'm you old. know, you were, you were in Vero Beach. You served with hospice. Um, you know, Fitz Allison was right there. No, Actually, not, I, I, I was in Sebastian, yeah. which is north of Vero Beach, which is not Vero Beach, but never mind. But yes. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, to, to Fitz Allison's point, you know, are you willing to die? It's not just, yeah, okay, I, I, I'm glad to be a martyr. No, you, are you willing to lose your reputation? You lose your family? Lose, there's so much you lose when you're uh, going to take up the cross and follow Christ. And it's so, a great question. It was a very wise question, and it's one that, uh, you know, I still ask myself again and again. Now my children are often grown, and was the sacrifice worth it? And the answer is yes, because though they may live in Seattle and San Francisco and be a little nutty in their political thinking right now, that will pass. The moral foundations that were laid, the basic faith, uh, is there. And, and it is coming out as they become older and as I see how they live and how they act and how they interact with other people, the, the, the knowledge and love of Jesus Christ is real in their lives. And that's what's important. Not whether they were, not whether I could afford to have a, uh, send them to the, a debutante ball like Susan had when she was 17 or 18. You know, that's not important. Mm -hmm. What is important is the, eternal life in Christ, and I've been able to give that to my children. Um, so I think Fitzsimmons Allison is a very wise man, and he's now at the age of 95, and he basically, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he's just cleaning up the books before the sure. uh, before the, register, the ledger's closed. Well, I have special news mm -hmm. for our audience. Anglican Unscripted has existed since 2009, but Anglican TV went on before that and we used to travel around the nation and around the world videotaping conferences and events and interviews. And I have some interviews with uh, Bishop Fitzsimmons a a Allison that I'm going to post links to. Uh, we did a, uh, a, a series in 2015 called The Three Bishops and discusses the problem we had back then and how we got to where we are. And uh, uh, Allison does a great interview talking about his time in seminary, coming to the realization that uh, not everybody agrees <laughs> that there's a God and they're going to seminary. And it's a wonderful interview. I'm going to post it in the show notes. Be sure to watch that. If you want to watch that whole series, The Three Bishops, I'll provide a link to that as well. But uh, uh, Godspeed, Fitz Allison. You're still doing wonderful things. Um, let's see. A-N-I-E, that's not here locally, that's over in Britain, is going to have some consecrations tomorrow, George. That's news. Yes, they're going to Foley Beach and an unnamed foreign primate. Uh, and you can probably assume he's one of the people that just was at the <laughs> Gavcon meeting. Be, yes. Uh, he and uh, some other bishops in the United States, Australia, and New Zealand will be consecrating for the Anglican Network in Europe, Tim Davies, Lee McMunn, and Ian Ferguson. Mm -hmm. A fourth bishop, Stuart Bell, will be consecrated here. And this will take place in Hull at a uh, vineyard church. And this f is the day before the weekend at Christ Church Newlands, which was that the late uh, Melvin Tinker established in Hull a very dynamic uh, independent Anglican parish and where they're going to offer the uh, uh, basically uh, a glimpse of what can be in Anglicanism in England and Wales and Scotland and it doesn't have to be what we've currently got now officially well what we have now is a church floundering in creeds and doctrine the Church of England on very hard soil Okay, Britain, uh, in all its parts, is hard ground. Uh, and I'm not going to uh, be here to talk bad about the British people, but they take more convincing <laughs> than uh, your average Midwesterner from Wisconsin. That's all I'm saying. 
and uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see now because the ANIE has had some fits and starts. They had a good engine, yeah. they had great wheels, a good body to the truck. But they didn't have fuel. I think the failures of Justin Welby have now provided the fuel for the ANINE to start the engine and start uh, taking some good ground in Britain, George. This, the, uh, sociologically speaking, this is the one, one of the many funny things about the United States of America. Though we have the standard of living that is among the highest in the world, it's akin to Western Europe and Canada and Australia. Um, our religiosity is akin to India and West Africa. The, the closest country in proportion to faith is is Ghana, and so we uh, we have an we have a economic life of the West, but we have a religious life akin to the global South, and so the soil is very fertile here. There, as many churches as uh, you know, churches pop up all the time. Uh, most people have, you know, uh, Kevin, you and I live in a part of Florida that is Christendom, where there's yeah, just yeah. certain per, certain assumptions about how life is, whereas that's not true in Europe. And sometimes it's very uh, foolish of an Americans to pass judgment on uh, European religious culture because we have such vastly different, vastly different worldviews. Uh, for instance, I look at this, like uh, some of these publications that say, they announce, oh my goodness, this politician's a Christian. And it's like, in the United States, you would only do that if he were a Muslim or a Hare Krishna, because you assume there yeah. is a Christian. I mean, to say that they're Christian is like to say that they speak English. It's just not on the radar as being extraordinary. Whereas in Europe, they make these and, and, things all the time. I think that's more here in the Midwest and South. You go to the coast, uh, L.A. or Chicago or New York, and they're more uh, judgmental of Christians. If you're a Christian, yeah. you've come under suspicion. Mm -hmm. Here in Florida, if I'm a Christian, I'm not suspicious. They pretty much know who I'm going to vote for. They know I pay my taxes on time. Uh, they know I'm a nice guy. Uh, they know that I'd be good at, as a, uh, a board member of the uh, HOA. Uh, th there's, there are assumptions. In New York, LA, Chicago, and some of the, our coastal cities, there's a suspicion that comes with Christianity that you're there to judge people. You're there to see other people's moral failures. And of course not, because we are sinners as well. But yeah, you're right, George. Uh, we should not at all judge European Christianity because, you know, a, a vast amount of the history of Christianity comes out of Europe. And, and the, the, uh, one, of the thing, one of the things that we're noticing uh, from a reporter's vantage is the wild success of immigrant churches in the UK. Nigerian churches, uh, Ghanaian churches, Ukrainian churches. Um, the Pol the Catholic Church has basically been resuscitated by Poles uh, moving to in England. Um, so we'll see what the future brings. But uh, in the United States, the new demographic data came out, and we have now have an uptick in the number of children being born uh, per, per, per family and per women and all this and that. So maybe the bad times... Maybe, yeah, the, keep talking. Maybe, maybe the bad okay. times. Somebody's are, about to attack and, the cat. And, and it's raining cats in Florida, too. Yes, it's, it uh, is raining cats. Yeah, oh, it's raining cats. The cat has been looking at the camera now for about two minutes, and I think he was about to pounce on it, and that would have been no. disastrous. No, it, the demographics are you know certainly uh, changing all the time. You and I talk about the pendulum of politics, the pendulum of religion. You know, things you know go back and forth. In this kind of decade-long pendulum, now I'm watching UK politics. I'm watching. We have coming elections here in November. The pendulum is they they ripped it off the pendulum, and it's it's a hatchet from one side to the other. You know, nobody's getting out of this alive uh, as far as American politics go. I was surprised to see the new prime minister of uh, the UK had to resign after 44 days. That was. Uh, um, uh, astonishing to me as a uh, amateur historian to, to see something like that, George. 
Yeah. Well, uh, what can you say? And yeah. I'm a little hesitant uh, to say anything because I really don't quite understand. Maybe it's just because we, we can't get rid of our prime minister or our president after 44 <laughs> days. So we just have to put up with it for four years that uh, I don't quite understand how you could be so lucky as to get rid of somebody who's not up to the job. But hey, there you go. Oh, my. Yeah. And it's it's interesting, once again, to see the press's role in this. Uh, the press has never been more powerful uh, in the West especially over in Europe and here uh, United States of America uh, and th they're having a much greater influence than they, they should ever have. They should be informers not influencers. That's my humble opinion. The institution that is the Church of England has failed at safeguarding a report says. George? And As uh, the late Gober Pyle said surprise, surprise, surprise. 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 <laughs> the uh, formal independent uh, inquiry into uh, ICSA is its abbreviation, and I can't remember all the uh, the nouns in that in that abbreviation. Has finally released its report on the churches in England, and it's nothing new in the sense that all the nasty stuff has been thoroughly aired ahead of time. And the churches have, you know, Justin Welby and Stephen Cottrell have given their abject, utter, complete apologies and take responsibility for this, which means nothing's going to change and not going to do anything about it. Uh, the Church of England has put out a statement saying lessons will be learned. It, It's almost, uh, I hate to be cynical, but I could have written all these things ahead of time. The one thing that caught my eye is the statement put out by Forward and Faith. And their, their statement, which came out Forward yesterday... Forward and Faith UK. Yeah. Forward and Faith UK, yeah. yeah statement on the ICSA's final report in the seal of confession. Ford and Faith welcomes the report. It's good to clean house, good to get rid of the perverts, good to get rid of the bullying and the lying and the back uh, scratching and cover-ups that the Church of England perfected so well. But as Ford and Faith said, there is one particular strand of the report which we must respond to immediately, and I'm reading here, given its serious and negative implications for church life. And that is that there should be a duty of disclosure for serious safeguarding matters, without exception, including breaching the seal of the confession. Fordham Faith says we're unaware of any evidence to suggest that this is a problem, and we're unaware of any evidence to suggest that applying the duty of disclosure to confession will make things better. Moreover, I'm continue reading. We are deeply uneasy at a secular body, ICSA, seeking to impinge on the administration of the church's sacraments. Okay, here comes my evangelical uh ohs. Well, it's like every time we talk about this, you get in more and more trouble because we do have, thankfully, a large Anglo Catholic audience. Uh, who watches Anglican Scripted, and they have opinion about the seal confession. That if Kevin were to uh, come in, we'd open up the prayer book, go to the con uh, confession section of the prayer book, and I said, listen, I murdered someone. Um, I would expect, as an Anglo Catholic or a Roman Catholic, that there's a seal. That yes, I'm going to be forgiven, uh, and that uh, I do not have to worry about my priest going to the authorities with my confession. Mm -hmm. As e more of a reformed evangelical uh, American westernized church, we think the priest kind of has an obligation uh, through safeguarding and other reasons to uh, take your confession to the authorities, George. Yeah, and we've talk, talked about this in the past in relation to the Australian Church, because the Australian Church went through this and they decided that the seal of confession can be breached uh, in certain ways, in certain circumstances. They've, the battle's already been fought, and the Anglo-Catholics lost in Australia. And they want to uh, hold on in the UK. Now, my particular view is, as an evangelical, I don't uh, disagree with the the importance of the seal of confession. My disagreement is with the auricular, meaning private, oral confession. Mm -hmm. At the time of the uh, Anglican Reformation, uh, that was one of the abuses that the church got rid of. And the homilies, which are one of the 
determining doctrinal statements of Anglicanism specifically reject auricular private confession. And we didn't have it in the prayer book. And and we didn't have it in the classical prayer book. And in recent years, the uh, the uh, service uh, for the sick has been sort of a way for people to wedge in private auricular confession. That's fine. Um, I have to say, I would ex- anticipate nine out of ten Anglicans in the Anglican clergy in the ACNA or in the Episcopal Church in the Church of England have never dealt with this issue. It's just not that common, except in one subset, which is the Anglo-Catholic world. The end, you know, part of it is uh, evangelicals and the Church of England's formularies, 39 articles teach there are only two sacraments. Forward and Faith uh, says there's seven. That's the Anglo-Catholic approach. And if they do believe, which they do, that there's seven, then the statement they make in their the letter, the sacraments are preserved and administered by the church and do not belong to us, they are therefore not ours to amend. If they have that view, then it makes perfect sense for them. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I support their right to uphold and believe that. I myself do not believe that, but that doesn't change the fact that, uh, you know, what they hold is part of their faith tradition. Yeah, I, I want to back that up, that we, we support, you know, your belief in the constraints of having second, seven sacraments. No, no, I, I find that nothing that's going to be a division with us. I'm a two-sacrament guy. But I appreciate seven sacrament people. I do so. So the the, the um, but it is a real issue where the government or an independent secular body is telling the church how to run its affairs. Yeah. If the church is going to, in Australia, it was done very messily, where in essence uh, secular forces change church. Uh, practice and for Anglo-Catholics impinged on dogma. If the church as a whole, and this is this is why we should have Lambeth conferences and meeting of primates, are discuss these issues, how do we as a church as a whole understand this issue and address the concerns where we have had some pervert priests, let's take Peter Ball, the bishop of uh, Bishop Peter Ball, who would use the sacrament of confession as part of his abuse techniques. You can't tell anybody this. This is between us and God and all this and that. How do you, uh, as a church, theologically, rationally, dogmatically, address the Peter Bowles? Now, it's part of the problem of this is that, you know, bad... Uh, you know, in the in the Episcopal Church, we had some rules, and it was assumed that the bishops would all act the same way. Then you had Charles Benison uh, come along, and bad bishops will do what they want and mess up mess up agreements for everybody else. Peter Ball was a bad human being, and he messed things up for the Anglo Catholics dramatically, set back their cause uh, in the popular eye. So, if the church is going to change. It needs to do so through the church's processes, I believe, not because somebody outside is telling it you got to do this. No, I agree. This is what the councils of the church are for. This is what the Lambus are for, is to get together and have some common understanding of the role without authority, the, the outside authority. You know. this is, and in some ways, this is the same argument as COVID quarantines and lockdowns. The formularies uh, and the rules of the Church of England is that a minister must offer worship every Sunday. The bishop doesn't have the authority to say, close the doors and you're not even allowed in. And a number of people got into trouble because they were faithful to the prayer book and the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England rather than to their bishops who were just taking on the role of secular functionaries. I uh, plead guilty in that my bishop told me we're shutting our doors. And I did so very grudgingly because I felt it was the wrong decision, but I didn't feel I had a leg to stand on because it was given to me as a pastoral directive. 
mm-hmm. which is the one thing the bishop can enforce against me. If he tells me you specifically you must do this <laughs> as a pastoral directive, yeah. you can't wiggle out of that. If he sends a letter out uh, to be read to the congregation, I can mislay it. I can forget it. <laughs> mislay it. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, <laughs> I put it by the shredder and oops. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. And in our, ca- and in our case, shutting our doors for the majority of time over a year and a half, two years was disastrous because mm-hmm. we are a snowbird congregation. We are a highly transitory congregation. People move here. People die here. And if we break that rhythm, we break the church and we broke the church where it fell in half. We did because, you know, the one place you should be able to go anytime is the church, especially mm-hmm. when there's a, a pandemic, a war, uh, times of uncertainty, uh, famine, earthquakes. The one place you should be able to go is the church where you can worship and fellowship. And we decided not just, yeah, I'm not going to blame individual bishops here. We decided almost as a Christian international uh, association, we're going to close the churches because that will save people. And history will judge us on that one, George. Yes, and I think we'll come up short. Yeah, I think so too. All right, let's talk about GAFCON 4. We mentioned the GAFCON Primates Council Communique. It included some information about the upcoming GAFCON 4 going to be held in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, they have a, uh, a new topic, To Whom Shall We Go, is going to be the, the header for this one. Um, I'm looking forward to it, especially after what we've seen coming out of uh, some international conferences of Anglicans in the last uh, six months. We need, some, we need some refresher, something to, to, to re-stifle the belief system here, George. Well, Kevin, I got to tell you, I know this theme was not thought up by an, by an American. Do you know why? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> because all I hear is Scarlett O'Hara saying, where shall I go? Where what shall, I, shall I do? <laughs> and Rhett Butler saying, frankly, Scarlett, I don't give a I damn. I don't give a damn. Yeah, no, I, and, I do. so, and so let's start the uh, uh, the journalistic memes now for that theme. But uh, it's unkind. But uh, no. So it was written well, by a non-American. But there mm-hmm. you go. So we, like Scarlett O'Hara, are on Terra wearing our uh, wearing the, our last dress as we try to rebuild our life. And uh, what is well, Gaffron I mean, going to do? You know, the, this is going to be a lot. And it's going to be uh, fun to watch because every time there's a bad Lambeth or a bad ACC meeting, uh, showing, app, showing, app, showing up at a Gafcon, whether it's in Jerusalem or Kenya or wherever, is exciting and encouraging because people are gathering together and they're not going to gather together to hear bad news. They're going to get gather together to be encouraging to one another to show that I'm not the only one who really believes the story of the Bible. All these guys here believe it too. You know, that we, we have a common belief system. We understand the same creeds. We hope for the, you know, the growth of the church and I'm talking to people who started dioceses who, you know, in five years have 300 churches in Africa or Asia. Yeah, that's very encouraging rather than going to some other places where they talk about, well, we may not have the budget we hope for because we're closing four churches and there's investigations going on here. It's a different place, George. Yeah, and one of the things that I think they'll talk about uh, uh, this was not said directly. I'm making a, a supposition here. Mm-hmm. They mentioned Michael Nazarelli uh, joined the Catholic Church in their communique. Mm-hmm. And if you remember at the time, uh, there were a great deal of comments, people on, the, uh, on our website, on all the news sites, that this is the start of something big. Nobody's followed yeah. Michael Nazarelli. It's, yeah, that's, yeah. It, it didn't turn out to be the way it is. And frankly if you look at the traditionally minded catholic press things are really bad i mean in the catholic world uh the pope just appointed an abortion activist to the papal uh, academy of life um you know that they've got as much material on their on catholic unscripted as we have on anglican unscripted (laughs) so the i I don't know 
Did we mention yet that uh, Gavin has a, a new show called uh, Catholic Unscripted? Uh, if I can find it, I'll put a, a link in the show notes for that as well. We support Gavin's uh, further career as a uh, pontificator. Uh, of a pontifical pontificator. He's, yeah, he's he's a great pontificator. Uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, speakers, uh, bar none. So, well, at Catholic Unscripted, which is Gavin Ashenden and two others, uh, it's that except they're three and not two. Uh, has as much material about the problems in the Catholic world as we do in the Anglican world, and I think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence mindset isn't isn't attractive anymore because uh and unfortunately the orthodox option with carol and company going a little <laughs> uh, well, no, okay we need to let, let's do a the carol story here um no. yes he went cuckoo has he come back from cuckoo i don't know uh the, the story is now that there was a meeting uh amongst some bishops of the orthodox church in russia involving carol and Carol, I'm sorry if I'm you know, pronouncing his name wrong, says war cannot be holy. After previous statements in the last two months indicating that uh, war can be holy and that they are fighting a holy war and Russian soldiers who die in this battle will go to heaven. So he's backtracked 180 percent. He stopped the train from smashing in to the wall. Yeah, and, and I think the exact quote was, war, huh, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. I can't and, do this with you, George. <laughs> Just, <laughs> and, uh, well, no, Carol met with uh, uh, the uh, interim leader of the World Council of Churches, along with some Russian Orthodox leaders in Moscow. And yeah. Carol basically said, war cannot be holy, <coughs> which is a step back from, as you mentioned, Kevin, Carol's statements that those who die in battle in this holy war have their sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a political calculation? Things aren't looking good. Is this a realization that I've gone too far and I need to return to Christian doctrine and teaching and pull back from Russian nationalism? Don't know. But uh, it's a positive development in the generally difficult world that is the Ukraine-Russia war. And the Orthodox Russian Church. Mm -hmm. No, and I don't know where this is going to lead. Uh, I would hope that he would maintain this uh, position and be vocal about it and teach about it and not go to jail. Well, no, I, I would hope he, you know, he would go to jail for it because this is something you want to defend with the principles of Christ, that you know there, there is no holy war. Now, we as Anglicans uh, certainly seek just war. But, well, Kevin, uh, you, know, you know that... Uh if you're a failure in politics or in journalism or religion, what happens if you get appointed a fellow at Harvard or Yale or Penn? That's I mean, right. there are ways out to these guys. <laughs> now Oxford. Oxford's been Weird. appointing those people. Okay, so uh, that is what we got here. Oh, you had a neat story, too. Uh, the Episcopal Church had their executive council meeting. Is it this week or next week? And the new president of the uh, executive council wants preferred pronouns on all future documents oh my uh julie harris is the new president of the house of deputies and she's all excited about this new job and opportunity and the wonderful thing about the episcopal church is that it's always pushing today yesterday's issue it's right I get these emails uh, from the Church Pension Fund saying, let us tell you about this wonderful thing we're supporting, ESG. Uh, and if you turn on the financial news, Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon, and Morgan Stanley, all the real financial pros are saying ESG is an absolute travesty. It's stupid. Oh, it's horrible, yeah. Go woke, go broke. But of course, the pension fund, they've just discovered this idea. Well, Julia Harris, in her excitement, nothing much happened. Half the people are brand new on executive council, so it'll continue chugging along in its course towards irrelevance. Actually, I think it already arrived at the irrelevance station. Yes. So this train is just at the siding, puffing away, waiting for it to go someplace. And one of the things she wanted to bring was uh, preferred pronouns to Episcopal, you know, statements and doctrines and, oh, I don't know, the prayer book. 
and fortunately they ran out of time before they could get into uh that little uh uh you know past issue i mean you know we've peaked uh, trans transgenderism has peaked and it's now on the downhill but of course this is when the episcopal church jumps in with both feet oh both feet i i was as i do out looking for news and i happened to go across the uh uh, Diocese of Connecticut's website, and I was there on the staff page. I don't know why. And I'm talking about the Episcopal Diocese of of, uh, of, of Connecticut. And uh, uh, lo and behold, this is the bishop and staff, and they are kind enough to provide their pronouns. Yes. Uh, yeah, Reverend Wright Jeff uh, Mello is a he, his... The Reverend Wright Laura Ahern's, uh, I was at her consecration, is a she, her. And if you go through here, as far as I can tell, all the pronoun pronouns match the biological sex of the person uh, on their staff. And I'm like, well, if that's so, why bother with this pronoun stuff? Isn't that just, you know, some type of redundancy or no it's just virtual signaling george it's uh um the world singing through the church well kevin you you gotta wonder why the diocese of connecticut is in financial trouble do you see how many oh, yeah. staffers they have yeah yeah they've always been staff heavy i remember when they used to have their now okay i need full disclosure here um i run an it company and many years ago before the connecticut six I was the hosting company for their website, um, and I did a lot of IT work for them uh, before uh, things went bad. This is before 2003, early days of Kevin, so I wanted to be upfront about that. Um, and yes, they had a, a headquarters on Asylum Avenue in Hartford, Connecticut, huge building with many, many rooms, and each room had a staff person. And some of those rooms had a staff person and an administrative assistant for that staff person. And I'm just like, what is your role here? Blah, 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 for the uh, blah, 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 blah. It was okay. You know, so. That's not all the news we got here. We got one more story. Uh, all right, final story. The Diocese of Florida says the election is a go. We reported last week, the last two weeks, that there were complaints about um, the election of Bishop-elect Charlie Holt. So they scuttled that election because of the complaints and said, okay, we'll have another election. They scheduled an election to go and there were complaints about, uh, listen, we, we haven't worked out the details from the last scuttle you did. Why do we want to do uh, a second election before we dot the I's and cross the T's and make sure everything goes our way? George, what's the latest information now? Standing committee heard all the objections that Charlie Holt was acting like a vicar general, even though he hadn't been elected, that all of the controversies and concerns hadn't been resolved, therefore it wasn't prudent to have an election. Standing committee said, fine, we hear you, we're going to have an election. So the election will be in November uh, next month, and we'll see what happens. Will the same people who complained last time find fault this time? I. I anticipate the because yeah, yeah, <laughs> they just don't want a conservative bishop in Florida mm -hmm. or anywhere. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 767 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>